You know what, Jamie? Let's pop off right now. We gotta get started. We gotta go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get the people in the chat. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hit and Hustle from irishsportsdaily.com. I am your host, Greg Flamong, and with me today is uh, Tyler Wojak of Locked On Irish Podcast. Uh, he's got a great podcast show that he started last year, I believe it was, around this time, and uh, it's taken off. He's done a really good job with that. Hopefully, you're subscribed to that um, and, and checking in his videos because he does a really good job, and we've got a show today. We're going to talk big picture, focusing on Marcus Freeman. We've we've had this conversation um like offline a number of times uh and we, we planned to do a show on this last year and then the show we ended up doing was like too long uh for one of the topics and so we were like we, we got to show it do it another time i decided i wanted to have tyler on our show and have him uh discuss where we think marcus freeman is after two years uh for more optimistic or more pessimistic uh for a little bit of both i think that's might be where we end up um, so that's going to be the show today. So thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, if this is your first time catching our show here uh, and you haven't done so already, please subscribe to this channel. Please hit the like button and uh, please hit the notification bell. So you know whatever it is, we are going live. Links to this podcast are in the description below if you prefer the audio uh, format. Um, and, it, you know, it's early January, Tyler. It's time to take stock in things. And uh, we're going to take stock in Marcus Freeman. And one thing that you can also do is take stock in uh, your closet. Take stock in your closet, what you got going on there in your dress shirt situation. And if you feel like you're lacking in an area, then what you can do is you can go to ESQ Clothing, uh, which has created the world's first bamboo dress shirt, which is crafted from high quality bamboo fabric. It's the softest and most comfortable shirt you'll ever put on. Not only more sustainable than cotton, also feels cooler, has stretch, is older and wrinkle resistant, and it's even machine washable. You've seen ESQ's one-piece collar bamboo dress shirt on all your favorite Notre Dame players and coaches. And it's the perfect shirt for today's business meeting or heading for a night out. Use ISD15 and get 15% off all online items. That's ISD15 ISD for 15% off. Uh, Tyler, thank you for being here. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. I'm happy to be here. It is kind of weird going on a podcast that I listen to regularly. I'm really excited to be here, obviously, but now I'm going to have to figure out something else to listen to later today when I'm doing laundry or in the car or something. But I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Do you listen to your own stuff? Do I? Uh, well, I, I listen to it when I'm done, when I'm just like making sure that everything came together. Well, uh, besides edits, besides edits and things of that nature. No, because I like I sort of take my own notes when I edit. And then honestly, I'm sort of like I'm in that spot where listening to my own voice is still kind of painful. And considering I have to do it so much already, yeah. I don't choose to do it more. Yeah, I'm a big <laughs> I'm a big subscribe. Don't don't listen like download, yeah. download, don't listen guy to my own stuff. Sometimes I'll listen just to, um, you know, to see how I'm flowing or how the thing flows uh, and things of that nature. But it's it look. Yeah, I, I think everyone's going to enjoy this. And to me, it's just I'm having a conversation with my bud. So uh, before we get going on Marcus Freeman, though, something just across the wire that you sent to me. Uh, let me read it because I got to uh, I, I, I got to do proper attribution here. Uh, this is reported by Zach Jackson uh, at Akron Jackson on X or on Twitter. Uh, the, the Browns, uh, this is according to sources, the Browns are working to hire Tommy Reese as tight ends coach and he'll have a role in the overall development of the pass game. His exact title is uncertain, and the hire is not yet official. Reese, 31, was Alabama offensive coordinator last season. Uh, Tyler, you 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 tweeted out or X'd out or whatever it is. Uh, your worlds are colliding. You're famously a Browns fan. Um, so how do you how do you take this news? What, 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 what are your feelings as of this moment? Um, I'm a little bit conflicted because for as much as I am a Browns fan, I might be the most pessimistic person when it comes to the fan or when it comes to the team. I would say that I made the really smart decision when I was about probably like seven or eight years old to really emotionally detach myself from the Browns organization because I'm already so emotionally invested in Notre Dame on Saturdays that doing the back to back thing might be a little too much, especially when it's the Browns and they have done nothing um, positive for the fans in, yeah. in like two decades. So usually I think that uh, whatever the Browns do is probably the wrong thing up until this past season uh, where things actually went 
right for the first time in a while, despite all the injuries that the Browns suffered this season. But as it pertains to Tommy Reese, I think it makes a ton of sense for him to go to the NFL. Um, considering Kalen DeBoer is bringing Ryan Grubb to Alabama, he was without yeah. a job. And I feel like his end goal was always to be NFL offensive coordinator. And I think it's uh, an easier path to get there by just getting in the league now even though people are going to see his title as tight ends coach. And this is not official at the time that we're recording this. It's probably going to be soon. Zach Jackson is the athletic writer, covers the Browns in the NFL at large. He does a great job. So he's not putting this out there unless there's some serious traction. Right. It seems like it It makes sense. You get to work under Kevin Stefanski, genius offensive mind. If he doesn't win NFL coach of the year, he's probably going to come in second behind D'Amico Ryan at, uh, with the Houston Texans. So I think it's smart to be in the NFL be with a guy whose stock is really high. He's a great offensive mind, and I don't think uh, it's going to be too long before he actually gets that role as an OC. Yeah, I mean, he he he's he feels like an NFL boy, right? Like he he wants to be in the NFL, you know. And it seems like that's more befitting of his his personality, right? Like he he seems like the type of person who is constantly just like talking ball, thinking ball. I mean, the type he's the type of guy who like watched every NFL snap right it, yeah. in, in a season he knows everything that's going on like he's really in the grind right and i feel like that's more befitting of the nfl game than it is a college game and look you know robert mays of the athletic and the key tweeted out you know it, it it might look weird going from oc to tight end coach but this is a good way into the league and you know he's going to be involved in you know he might have some sort of passing game coordinator role he might have some sort of role that's just beyond position coach um, and I think he, look, he has a good reputation, right? Whether, however Notre Dame fans feel or Alabama fans feel or whatever, it, he has a good reputation in the NFL in college. Like people think highly of him. So this is a good step for him. And it's just saying, you know what? Like I'm going to be in the NFL now. I'm going to be an NFL guy. And I, I can't see him going to college again, unless it's to be a head coach somewhere. If, if that's what he wants to do. Right. So uh, you know, good luck to him, right? He's 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 our, a native son, right? He's given a yeah. lot to Notre Dame, and uh, it's it, it, it t twists and turns, uh, as as uh, as I guess it's a is a is a nice way to put it. But uh, good luck to him. Let's see let's see how it works out. And look, he's with Cleveland, right? They're running a ton of play action in Cleveland, Tyler. It's it's yeah. I was actually just thinking the one good thing for him if he does take the title of tight ends coach is yeah. he gets basically a year off from intense scrutiny because yeah. the past, what, three or four seasons, ever since he took the job as the Notre Dame OC, he has been under the microscope and the subject of constant ridicule, ridicule first from the Notre Dame fan base and then the Alabama fan base. So at least if he's with the Browns and he's just a tight ends coach, when Browns fans inevitably uh, get upset, most of that is going to be targeted at Stefanski, and he sort of gets a break from it for for a little bit of time. And I'm sure he's excited about that. That's a good point. I mean, every every play call is just completely, you know, like he had such a good year for Alabama. It just relatively speaking, right? Like, yeah. got them to you know beats Georgia, uh, got Jalen Milrow. I think he found you know the right way to use Jalen Milrow, and then the, the play call and the, and the Rose Bowl doesn't work. They lose, they miss on fourth down yeah. and uh, he's a goat, right? He, and everyone's yep. mad at him. So uh, we'll see how it works out for him. Uh, all right. To the topic at hand, Marcus Freeman, uh, after two years, um, I think, you know, you go nine and four, 10 and three. Um, I think that, and I'm, I'm actually curious to get your view on this part of it is, is I've kind of been of the view that he almost had a, a tougher position to be in than Brian Kelly did when Brian Kelly took the job in 2010. And the reason for that is Brian Kelly had a ton of like top end talent on that 2010 team. Right. And on that 2010 roster, right? Like you had, you had Michael Floyd, you had Manta Teo, um, you had offensive linemen, like Tyler Eifert was there. Sierra Wood was there. Theo Riddick was there. Uh, TJ Jones was coming in. Uh, he had the, the quarterback in Dane Christ, which didn't work out, but, you know, there might have been some injury concerns there. He had a good defensive line. He had good corners like Harris, Harrison Smith is on campus, Kaepernick Lewis Moore. Um, so you had some really good top end talent there. It's just like they didn't have the culture, right? They didn't have they didn't have the 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 know how to win games, right? And that was a lot of what we saw in 2010. They found ways to lose games. 2011, they found ways to lose games. But having the talent base allowed him to move forward 
you know, kind of in 2012 when they, when they finally did figure out how to win. Whereas Marcus Freeman, it was, you know, they, they had the culture, right? Accustomed to winning. But maybe the top end talent wasn't as good as uh, as you would have wanted, right? He lost Kyle Hamilton, right? He like he didn't have that guy. He he lost um, the you know some of the offensive linemen, right? Like he he didn't inherit like a great offensive line and in terms of experience in twenty twenty two. And then you know obviously the quarterback situation, right? Like that was very much up in the air. So I guess, do you feel like? His job, you know, do you feel like going nine and four, 10 and three is a little bit better than people would have expected when Notre Dame was, you know, uh, in, in 2021, they were 11 and one 2020 there. Obviously they were, they were 10 and zero in the regular season, finished 10 and two in the playoff appearance. Do you feel like he had a bit tougher job than people would have thought uh, when, when he ultimately took the job at the end of 2021? I think two things can, can be true. I think that, um, he had a good situation comparatively. I think that what Marcus Freeman inherited was uh, a better situation than what Brian Kelly did. However, it wasn't as good as we thought it was. And um, as I was getting ready to do this with you today, because I knew what we were going to be talking about, I actually went back and read some of the articles about Marcus Freeman when he was hired. And it's kind mm -hmm. of funny reading all that stuff now, knowing what we know about how the past two years have gone and all of the things, all of the pros basically uh, that were a big reason why he was hired. A lot of it has either not worked out like it was expected to, or was pretty much immediately changed. And the circumstances were a lot different, most notably the coaching staff. Like that was a big piece in all of it, right? They wanted to elevate uh, Marcus Freeman and keep the staff intact. I remember like after he got hired, you saw all the coaches, even Mike else who's like, I'm staying. And like, there yeah. was this big movement and everyone's staying on board. And it was really exciting. And then, a couple weeks later, Lance Taylor leaves, uh, Mike Elston leaves. A couple guys were, you know, not chosen to be brought back like Adele Alexander, Jeff Quinn. So there was a lot more staff turnover than I think anyone would have expected. And I think that the roster wasn't quite as good uh, as we thought it would be. A big piece of that was the quarterback. But still, like you said, the culture was in place. And when we talk about culture, so much of it is dictated by the strength and conditioning coach, Matt Bayless, who was a big part of that. Um, the built by Bayless program, all that, that really started way back in 2016. So we did have that. It was still a mostly veteran team. So I thought that he definitely had some things working in his favor, but there were obviously some holes that we didn't recognize at the time, or maybe we were a little bit more uh, willing to accept might not be as big of a deal. And I think the coaching staff was a big piece in that. Um, and he made the, the great hire of Al Golden, but overall, I think that you know, in his first season on the job, being tasked with uh, hiring a lot more guys than he probably ever anticipated mm -hmm. he would in the first year did have a negative effect on the wins loss record as the season went on. So, yeah, I think it was uh, a little bit better than what Brian Kelly had, but it was not as good as what we thought in the moment. And I think that's a big reason why the first two years have not been quite as successful as we thought they would be when he was hired. Yeah, like it's a good point you made about like, the, the idea was that they're going to maintain the culture, right? You have a ready-made, you have a ready-made program. I believe this was the narrative at the time. Like yeah. you have a ready-made program that is going to, uh, you just got to take the next step, really. Like that's the problem. Notre Dame can make, Notre Dame can make the playoffs. You know, they can go 11 and one, right? But you got to win in the playoffs. And that's what Marcus Freeman is going to bring that and the recruiting piece, right? And, and like you said, like it, it kind of didn't work out, right? Like he, he lost a lot from the staff. Um, he did keep Matt Bayless. Right. Uh, but the, the, you know, he was the defensive coordinator. They brought in someone else uh, and they, they lost a, a few coaches there. Uh, like that you said, they lost Lance Taylor, lost Mike Elston. Um, and, but you, you know, it was kind of like, Hey, we're, we're going to bring in some upgrades. It's going to be fine. Right. But then it just didn't work. It just didn't really work out that way. Like they, they made a the decision not to not to go into the portal at quarterback. And that really cost them, obviously, you know, A against Ohio State and then B against Marshall, you know, and then you lose the game against uh, Stanford. And, and and you just like you look at you look at the team and you think, man, like they're, they're not that loaded. Like they don't have that much. Like especially like you look at the wide receivers. You, it was it was uh, just like, man, I. Lorenzo Styles is supposed to be this this superstar, yeah. right? And and you look at you know a year later, he's not not even no, he's not on the roster. He's not even playing offense. You know, he's he's at Ohio State. And he, he took a redshirt year last year, 
So it, it, it's a good point that you bring up about, um, you know, it just the, the premise behind Freeman. Like if you look today, pretty much everything's different, right? It, yeah. With the exception of like Dylan McCullough and Mickens and uh, Chris O'Leary, like everything is pretty much turned over, right? Um, and so, you know, you say you, you said just a second ago, you know, the, the, the seasons weren't as good as you would have or we would have predicted. Do you feel like going into this year, right? Do you feel like what you thought the year would be and coming out of it? Like, do you feel like that was it was uh, it was kind of like a bad year from Freeman or like a bad year for the program? And are you are you kind of are you more optimistic about what you've seen or are you kind of more on the on the downside of what you've seen? Referring to 2023? Yeah. I think it was a disappointing season. Um, I wouldn't call it a failure, which I might have actually done on a show, which (laughs) (laughs) it happens. (laughs) I think uh, emotions were certainly running high after that Clemson game. And I think in the aftermath, in the immediate aftermath of that game, it certainly felt like a failure because of that complete no-show. I think it was disappointing in the sense that um, you look at the talent on defense and you look at how well they played and to have three losses despite all of that, it really goes back to the offense. And not all of that is on Freeman. We could get into the offensive coordinator search that went wrong and the circumstances there. And I think part of it is just on the players. Like Sam Hartman, um, I have found myself defending him for most of the year, and I still think that he wasn't as bad as some people on message boards might say he is, but he wasn't as good as the expectations we had for him going into the season. He was uh, if he wasn't the savior, he was certainly a player who was looked at as someone who could elevate the entire offense. And yeah, there were concerns about the receiver room, but the thought was like, well, Sam Hartman is going to be so good that it's going to make life easier on the receivers. That didn't work out like we had hoped. Part of that is due to injuries. It's not all on Hartman either. Like anything, there's a lot of blame to go around. But I do think that it was disappointing, but it, it happens, man. It's only a second season. And even if it was disappoint- disappointing, it wasn't like a colossal failure. They still won 10 games. Um, they had a couple of nice wins. I mean, you and I enjoyed that USC win probably more than anyone else because we're out here in Los Angeles and we have to deal yeah. with USC fans all the time. And even if, even if USC didn't finish that strong, like that was a big moment for him, um, especially coming off a really disappointing loss to Louisville to be able to get the team ready to play and, and perform like that against rival is important. They were able to bounce back after that loss to Clemson. So I think if you look at it in totality, it was disappointing. But one thing Freeman has shown is that he can learn from the mistakes he made. Like the first year, lost to Marshall and Stanford. Going into 2023, the one thing that he absolutely could not do was lose to teams that you shouldn't. And, yeah, they were favored against Clemson. But, yeah, you know, that's a that's a pretty decent Clemson team. They still have Dabo Sweeney and all that. So I don't really put that in the same vein as, as Marshall or Stanford at all. So he learned from that. He grew in year two, and I think that even though it was disappointing as a whole, there are certainly signs that he's learning um, and he's developing and he learns from his mistakes and can apply those going forward. And I think there's plenty of reasons to be optimistic about what he and the team can do in 2024 based off what they failed to do in 2023. What What is your biggest concern about him? Like from, I guess, from what you've seen, I guess, what was your biggest concern coming into this year? And do you feel like that has been alleviated? I mean, like you kind of mentioned a second ago, he, he he's his ability to learn, right? And I agree with that. That's a, that's a good point you made. But what what like what was your biggest concern coming in, and is that still your biggest concern now? Like, do you have a what's your biggest concern about him? My biggest concern when he was hired. Well, let me rephrase that. My biggest concern as the offseason started to go on after he was hired was assembling the staff. I was really yeah. nervous about that because he had just never done it, and mm-hmm. I realized that. It is so important. Like if you were to write down all of the priorities of any head coach at any level in college football, like what is what skills are most important? I think the ability to hire good coaches is at the very top. Like recruiting is obviously one or two or three, but like hiring coaches is just as if not more important uh, than um, acquiring players because they're obviously crucial in recruiting as well. So at the time I was most nervous about that. I think that he's demonstrated that, He has a good eye for talent in the coaching realm. Um, He added Mike Denbrock. That was huge. The Al Golden hire was a slam dunk. The Chancey Stuckey thing didn't really work out as planned. I don't really fault him for the Jared Parker decision either, but I think overall the guys that he has hired have done a good job. So consider that box checked. I would say my biggest concern now is the in-game management. Um, 
there have been some really questionable decisions at times, usually at the end of the first half, um, that really make you just go, what is what is happening here? With just the way he manages the clock and things like that. Look, like that's going to be a learning curve for any new head coach because you can do all this prep during the offseason and try to forecast different scenarios. But until you're actually in the moment, until Ohio State is on the doorstep of scoring the game-winning touchdown, you really don't know how you're going to react. And I think you know, that one is the most glaring issue when Notre Dame only had 10 men and we can point fingers all we want. I think that falls on the head coach at the end of the day. That was pretty, uh, pretty concerning. And there's been some other times where Notre Dame actually, I think, got away with one, like the Duke game when Marcus Freeman was literally heard on video saying, just run it basically to run out the clock and set up a yeah. field goal. I mean, that could have ended really poorly because for as big of a leg as Spencer Schrader had, he was wildly inconsistent at times when it came to how accurate he was. So I think that's the stuff that I'm most concerned about because I think he's uh, shown that he he understands the importance of the transfer portal, high school recruiting. He's done a really good job in those departments. I think he's hired a really good staff. But on Saturdays in the fall, when it's coming down to the wire, I am going to be a little bit nervous about the decisions that he makes in the game. And I hope that he shows this year that he's learned a lot uh, going into year three. So the in-game stuff is is interesting because I agree with you. Like there's a lot of s- weird things. Like even just talking about how like he wants Estime to go down, right? Where it's like, yeah. no, just take the lead there, you know? Because yeah. it, it just you're, – you're, 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 it's almost like too cute by half, right? Like just – no, just take the lead. Like he doesn't need to be going down at the thing and, and hope for a field goal. Like you're afraid that Duke's going to drive on you. Like, no, don't, don't be like yeah. that. Like it's just, they're not going to go down and score a touchdown, you know? Um, so there's that piece, but also like, I always go back to like, I, you know, obviously the BK years, he did some really bonehead things like in, in kind of same situation, like going for two when you don't need to go for two, like against Northwestern in 2014, like he's going for two, when they're up three and it's like, why are you going for two here? Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like it literally cost them the game. Like it did. And, and he, he's had situations like that, like going for two, you know, down 15 against, uh, against Clemson in 2015 when he's like, Oh, you know, uh, no, I'm sorry. They were down 12. And it's like, you can go down 11. It's like, well, we got to do it eventually. It's like, yeah, but you you put yourself in a bad hole. It's like you had to go for two again and you didn't get it. So it's just like it, it, he 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 was chasing the points there, and so like I, I don't know if it's if it's that or if it's like he's just never going to be the type of coach that like makes those good decisions, and maybe that's true. But like, is that the thing that's inhibiting or inhibiting him? Right? Is that what it is? And like to me, I, I just feel like my biggest concern about him is like. I guess with every Notre Dame coach, it's like the, the idea behind him was he can bring Notre Dame to the next level. Well, where's the evidence that that's actually the case? You know what I mean? Like it's, he's not been that much different than BK in which case, like that's, that's not a bad thing, right? Like obviously his first two years by record were better than BK. Um, you know, and you could say last year's schedule was a lot harder than BK like you would have had. You know, especially in like 2021, for example. Like the, the I think he got very fortunate. BK did in 2021 when it's like I just don't think that that schedule like really holds up to anything. Like they really yeah. didn't win a, a big game in 2021, right? They played one big game against a team that could that could really threaten them, and that was Cincinnati, and they and they got beat, right? The rest of the time, you're playing a bunch of flawed teams with bad defenses. Um, and so, you know, that – it's like you go the 11-1, and one, and it's like, well, Marcus Freeman's taking over those teams. Like, I do feel like – I'm pretty confident that Freeman's not a bad coach at this point. Like, he's shown too much, right? Like, beating Clemson in 2022, like, that, that's a good job. Like, that's a good coaching job, right? Like, beating USC the way that they did, like, that's a good coaching job, right? So I, I, I'm I'm fairly confident that he's not a like a bad coach by any means, right? I don't think that Notre Dame is going to go like seven and five, six and six, right? And 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 one thing that I kind of you know brought up to you after last year, because I know you were kind of like, man, I, I don't know about Marcus Freeman. Like it's just like the, the Stanford game. Like everyone talked about like Stanford and Marshall, right? 
And that was a big deal. And I was always like, yeah, but you know what? Like if he was bad, that would have spiraled. Like that could have been five and seven, you know, six and six, something like that. And the fact that that didn't happen shows me something about him. Right. So I, I just feel like he's, he's shown enough as a coach to be like, he's going to be fine. He, he can go 10 and three, he can go 10 and two, he can go 11 and one. But the other thing that kind of, I don't want to say concerns me, but it's just may just be a fact is that it's interesting that when he got brought in, like his biggest quality, which is that the fact that he's a recruiter and he's a dog recruiter was kind of undercut by the fact that NIL is such a big deal now. And that it, no matter what you do, you can't convince a guy to take less money, no matter who it is. You, 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 you might not be able to convince a guy like Caleb Downs. Just, I'm going to throw him out there. Right. If he, if he, if, if, if otherwise he would have gone to Notre Dame, but it's like, Hey man, like other schools are offering more money. Well, so I'm just, I'm not, you're not going to get, get me out of Georgia. You know, you're not going to get me to go to Notre Dame out of Georgia. Right. That concerns me. Like what is the actual upside of his recruiting ability? And so like, do you feel like he can mitigate that? Do you feel like he, there's enough there to where he can actually build a championship roster mitigating the fact that he's not going to be able to recruit the way that we thought he would when he was hired in 2021. I do. And I think part of that has to do with the advancements that Notre Dame has made in that NIL department. I think that we probably overestimated his ability to land like elite five stars at the time, even if NIL weren't as big of a factor as it is now. I think that definitely was a big factor in losing Keon Keeley, Peyton Bowen. Like that class really suffered because Notre Dame Don't didn't really more. have. Yeah, really. Notre Dame didn't have everything, like all their ducks in a row when it came to NIL. That showed itself, uh, especially at the end of that recruiting cycle as they lost Keeley, as they lost Bowen, they lost those guys. Yeah. Now I feel better about Notre Dame's position in that NIL space. So I think that Freeman can mitigate that. I think the fact that Notre Dame is even in the running for a guy like Dallas Golden uh, is a sign that Freeman has been recruiting at a little bit higher level. But yeah, if you look at the recruiting rankings, they're not that far off from what Brian Kelly did at the end of his tenure at Notre Dame. I think that there's a real argument to be made that if Brian Kelly were still the head coach at Notre Dame with the same exact recruiting approach, that his recruiting rankings in the NIL world at Notre Dame would be a lot lower than what they are now. I think that's fair. And I think, you know, we might come off as like a little critical of Marcus Freeman. I think you and I both believe in him and believe uh, in the future of what he can do at Notre Dame. We're just basically looking at what he's done the last two years. And for as, uh, as great as he is and for as excited as we are about what could happen down the line, the fact is that the record is not that great. Um, they've had some complete no-show performances. So that's just part of the deal when you have a young head coach. And I think when he was hired, a lot of us were really hoping that he'd be like uh, Lincoln Riley or Ryan Day, where it's the incumbent, it's the coordinator who gets elevated to the head coaching position and then basically just keeps the train rolling. But the biggest difference there is that Ryan Day kept pretty much Urban Meyer's entire staff at Ohio State, which we mm -hmm. know is one of, if not the best coaching staffs in the en entire country. Um, and Lincoln Riley was the same deal at Oklahoma. So he, they were able to keep that going uh, and sort of build on what those prior coaches had done. It hasn't really been the case for Marcus Freeman. That's not to say that he won't eventually be able to reach that level of success. Um, and I think that as time goes on, this class of 2025 is a great sign. The guys that they're getting, I do think that eventually now that Notre Dame kind of has everything in order, I don't think they're ever going to be consistently top five in recruiting, but I think that they can hover between six and 10 and be good enough in the transfer portal and at retaining their own guys that I think eventually Freeman can get to that level. It's just taking a little bit slower than we thought when he got hired. So like, I think Freeman is, he is better, like, to be where Kelly is or was, I guess, like around that area, takes so much more for Freeman than it did for Kelly to yeah, do the same no thing doubt. because of the NIL piece, right? Like he's he's recruiting better than Brian Kelly is at LSU. And he has that advantage, right? Like he has that in-state advantage where it's like he gets all the L he gets all the Louisiana guys and he's right next to Texas. He's right next yeah. to Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi, right? Like he's he's all in that area. And it's like he has that built-in advantage, and and Marcus Freeman's out recruiting him. Like, 
he's definitely a better recruiter. It's not that it's not that he, he I feel like the, the recruiting has fallen flat or anything like that, or he's been a disappointment. In fact, I, I don't think he's been a disappointment at all. I'm just saying, like, if you knew when he was hired that it, it was still going to be around eight, nine, ten, even 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 with the changing landscape, you'd think like. I don't know. Like that's, that's, that's a little bit different, right? Yeah. Can you imagine if when he was hired, I told you, okay, over the next couple of cycles, they're going to finish outside the top 10 and then they're going to be fringe top 10. Oh, and by the way, they're going to lose Lance Taylor. They're going to lose Tommy Reese. Eventually they're going to lose all these coaches on the staff. And yeah, they're, it's going to take a couple of years before they get NIL figured out. You think like, oh my God, the, the program is going to be in free fall. And it's not, which right. I think is a testament to what Freeman can do as a coach. Right. Like that's why I say like, he's definitely not bad. Right. And, and the, th the other part is like, he's not bad, but he's clearly also, he clearly doesn't have it or at least he didn't. I, I don't say doesn't yeah. cause it's, we don't know, but he didn't have it all figured out. Right. Like he really did put the staff together in a, in a, it's just kind of like a rushed way. Like there's no way that he knew exactly what, um, you know, he was getting out of, you know, even Tommy Reese, right. Or Harry, he stand, right. Like Harry, he stand was around for a year and he was tied for Tommy Reese. Like he wouldn't, that, that's not a good hire, right? Like you want someone who's going to be around for a little bit, you know, you want to build some continuity there, but it's like, Hey, it, it, it's a good hire. And that like at the time you think, well, of course I'm gonna hire Harry. Easton. But now I feel like he has like the proper staff in place, right? Like Mike Dembrock is a, is, is he's knows Notre Dame. He just had the number one offense in college football and it fits what the, what the team is, you know? And I feel like he's comfortable there. I think even if Al Golden, if they were to lose him to the NFL, like they still have like the base structure in what they want to do. He can just elevate Mike Mickens and he's a defensive coordinator himself. Um, I've actually been like a pretty big advocate of, like, hey, let's get let's let's get Marcus Freeman like more involved in the defense. You know, like we watched D'Amico Ryan's like his first rookie year as a head coach with the Texans, and he's calling the defense, and he's the head coach in the NFL. Like, I feel like Marcus can, Freeman could manage it. You know, um, at least a lot more than he, than he he has. Right, he's pretty hands off. Not that it hasn't worked out. Like, obviously Al Golden's done a great job, but I just feel like more Marcus Freeman with hands on on the X and O portion of the team i think that would be a good thing um the the thing that i i kind of come back to like yes notre dame has absolutely stepped up their nil game right they 100 you, you don't land uh you'll land riley leonard you don't land sam hartman you don't land chris mitchell you don't land bo collins and all the guys that they've landed if you you have a subpar nil situation they don't right and and I think they do a really good job with their with the, with the guys that are on the roster as well. But like, you're not landing, you're not going to land Caleb Downs. You're not going to land Caden Proctor. You're not going to land uh, whatever the version of Jordan Addison is, or Caleb Williams. I mean, Caleb Williams was a little bit different because of Lincoln Riley. But like, you see what I'm saying? Like yeah. that top guy, Jameer Gibbs, Jameson Williams, right? Like those are the the, the kind of the team changing guys that Notre Dame isn't going to land. And so something that like concerns me with the way that, you know, Marcus Freeman has recruited and the way that not just Marcus Freeman, but just the way the program is, I guess, is where, where are you going to get that? Just like that dominant three, four guys from where it's like, these are three, four guys that everyone in the country wants. You know, because like right now, I feel like you have you have Ben Morrison. You know, just from a talent standpoint, I could I'd say Christian Gray. You know, maybe some of the linebackers. You know, and and maybe Riley Leonard fits that as well, right? Um, you know, you could say maybe about Jadarian Price or Jeremiah Love. Like that's kind of remains to be seen. But right now, I don't know that they really truly fit into that category. Like, where are those guys coming from? Because that's what I feel like Notre Dame needs. That's what they had when they were such a dominant program, you know, in the in the, the early 90s, late 80s. Yeah, I think with that, it's sort of the, you know, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? I think that Notre Dame has to prove that they can win at the highest level 
under Marcus Freeman with the way that the roster is currently uh, constructed. And I think that if they do that, they can prove that, hey, they can play with the big boys. I think then they become, um, you know, uh, more of an option to a guy like Caleb Downs. Because where are these guys going? They're going to Alabama. They're going to Ohio State. They're going to Georgia. They're going to a place who has proven that they can win, that they can be developed into an NFL prospect. And, yeah, they're probably going to get a bag to go along with that. And something that my friends and I were talking about this weekend as we're watching these NFL games is it's it's almost like, I don't want to say shocking. That's probably too hyperbolic. But it's surprising how many guys from Notre Dame in the NFL are playing at a really, really high level on really good teams. Like Drew Tranquil was the leading tackler for the Chiefs last night, despite the fact that the Browns got absolutely housed by the Texans. Jeremiah owusu Cormoa might have been – the best player on the field, Kyle Hamilton. I know I don't need to tell you about him, but he's been having one hell of a season for the Ravens. Kyron Williams. Like these are real dudes that frankly, Notre Dame hasn't really had this many guys playing at that level in the NFL. Like you see all these graphics coming out, like the only team with this many players left in the NFL, it's Notre Dame. And in some cases they actually have more than Alabama and Georgia. So I'm sure that the staff is using that as a recruiting uh, tool, but they have not won under Marcus Freeman enough to become a viable option for those top guys who are trying to get a bag and they're trying to win and they're trying to go to a place where they can win immediately. But I feel like going into the season, if they can demonstrate that they can go undefeated or go 11 and one, especially with the schedule that they have, win a playoff game. um, You know, if they go down to the wire with one of the big boys in the second round of the playoffs, I think that's going to go a long way and not only showing to the world that Notre Dame could compete at this level with Marcus Freeman as the head coach, because I think you got to basically forget about the 2018, 2020 playoff appearances, because like that feels so long ago. And that was under Brian Kelly, totally different regime that even though Notre Dame was there, it doesn't really matter as much in the current state. So if they can do that, if they can get to the playoff, it has to be this year. Like <laughs> it's got to happen now. If they could do that, prove they belong. And now that they have the NIL, Thing in order and then you look at the NFL and what they've been able to produce I actually think that they will become more of an option and then later on then they can start competing for a national championship once they've proven to those top guys that hey if you come to Notre Dame you can make money and play with the big boys and then go to the NFL just like you can at all those other big time programs it's a good point about the visibility with Notre Dame in the NFL like just another like like Julian Love is one yeah See, I'm forgetting guys. I that would right. never have happened five years ago. <laughs> like Alohi Gilman is right. like a full time starter for the Chargers, and like he's a pretty big deal out there. Like when I went to the Ravens Chargers game, he was on like a lot of the promos, like the in in game promos that they do. Yeah, um, which was I was like, wow, it's a lot of a lot of Alohi Gilman and like premium positions too. Yeah. Like you always have the tight ends, right? And you always have the linemen, like Aaron Banks, another one where it's like he's a huge part of. He's like the starting Glenchy. guard. Yeah. Yeah, McGlinchey, but like, like I think McGlinchey and Nelson because they were first first rounders. But like Aaron yeah. Banks is as as an offensive lineman, like he, they could go to the Super Bowl. You know, like yeah. multiple players could be you know Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl guys, and and obviously Kyle, like first team All Pro, right? Uh, Kyron Williams, second team All Pro at running back, like a Notre Dame running back, second team All Pro. Like that's like just the thought of it is kind of um, is kind of crazy. So that's that's a good point there. About and it is like there is a chicken and egg standpoint or a you know kind of mindset in this. It's like what has to happen first. I mean, I do feel like, and I've always kind of had this this in my mind. Like they need to get lucky. I, I don't want to say lucky because it's like like if if for for example, like if it just turned out that Cam Williams, like you got to hit on like one of these classes where it's like you just get three or four like yeah stars, you know, like. Like Cam Williams, oh, it just turns out like he's he's going to be like one of the best wide receivers in the NFL or in, in college football, you know. And and uh, it, you know, it's a uh, Christian Gray is is also like a superstar, you know. And then like, Jeremiah Love hits, and then Kedron Young hits, and then Micah Gilbert hits, you know. And just like you, you just get like three, like all of a sudden, it's like Notre Dame has three wide receivers who are young who are just awesome, right? It's kind of like that's how it happened for like USC, like what it, you know, this was like before your time like probably literally um but like they hit the reggie bush class right like yeah. that class came through they hit with them and then they just rolled those guys all the way to three titles you know and that 
that just like does so much. Right. And then that, that carried USC's reputation for, you know, the rest of the decade, basically, even though they never really went on to win anything, it was like, well, USC is like just this dominant program. It's like winning yeah. Rose Bowls all the time and, uh, and, and things that, you know, things of that nature. So, um, it, it's just like, for me, it's hard to, it's hard to envision Notre Dame getting to that point and just kind of like projecting, like, is Marcus Freeman the guy to get them there? You know? And it's like, it's hard because I, I mean, I guess, I guess no one really would have thought this about Holtz, you know, after his second season, after they fell apart in 1987, is the way that, 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 that season ended, you wouldn't have seen that. Um, but like, there've been so many just like failures since then, you know, since that Holtz era yeah. where it's like, you think, yeah, like Notre Dame's going to turn the corner. It's like, no, they actually didn't. And they had this fatal flaw, you know, in, in the recruiting or the NIL space. Um, but let's look at this, this kind of upcoming team. Do you feel like this team is set up to, to kind of make a run? You know, you said the playoffs uh, are kind of a must and I would agree with that now that you, you can get 12 in, although it's really 11 because the 12th spot is basically reserved for the highest G or uh, power or stupid uh, role, group, group yes. of five. Yeah. The highest group of five conference champion or whatever. Um, so they're going to get the 12 spots. So really it's 11 spots. Like, do you feel like Notre Dame is in position to do something in 2024? I do. I think there's several factors at play. I think the schedule as it stands right now and now, honestly, like when you talk about what a schedule is or what it isn't going to be in January, almost always it ends up being something different than what you thought it would end up being. I think that's certainly the case with Notre Dame's schedule this past season. Maybe the teams that we thought were going to be great, like USC, ended up not being great. But then there's a team like Louisville who ended up mm -hmm. being better than we thought they would be going into the season. But if you look at the schedule, I think it's certainly favorable. I think that with all the the talent coming back on defense, that's really encouraging. That's the most important thing, honestly, I, I, in all of this. They're going to have a great defense again. Um, we expect Al Golden to be back next season, even if he does end up uh, leaving for the NFL, if that ends up happening. Um, I still think the defense is in good shape just with the players they have. And I think that there's plenty of reasons to be encouraged about the offense. Now, I am very much uh, concerned about the offensive line. Not because I think that they'll be bad, but I think that if Notre Dame wants to be great, if they want to compete at the highest level, the offensive line has to be elite. They can't just be good. That's not the way that Notre Dame is structured. So when I say I have concerns, people might get confused like, oh, like most teams in the country would love to have Notre Dame's offensive line. That's true. But Notre Dame isn't really concerned with what most teams want. It's what the best teams want. Yeah. And they need to have an elite offensive line in order to get to that level. Most of it just has to do with the fact that there's a lot of inexperience at that line, and they could end up developing into a really good line. I think the 2018 offensive line, they weren't great immediately, and by the end of the year, they were a lot better than the year before. But, yeah, I think they are really set up to have some success this year. It's Freeman's third year. We know the history with Notre Dame third-year coaches. A lot of them have either made the national championship or won it. I don't think that it's national championship or bust for Marcus Freeman, but there has to be some proof of concept that he's learned from these first two years and that – He's taken those lessons and he's going to be able to apply that into a really high quality football team. And I think that despite my concerns about the offensive line, there's reason to be optimistic about the running back situation and mm -hmm. enhanced receiver room. So yeah, it's, it's partially exciting because I think that for the first time in a long time, you can kind of look at this team and go like, they might have something here, like not just 10 wins, like this team could be really good. But with that, comes the fear of not living up to those expectations and what could happen if they don't. And it's an interesting time, especially in January to think about all of that. But, uh, Hey, I'd much rather be in that position where we have a lot to look forward to or a lot to be excited about than the other. We're like, man, I just hope we get nine wins this year. So <laughs> I think there's going to be a lot of pressure, uh, but pressure makes diamonds, right? Isn't that the, the old saying? I, that's what people say. That's, that's what people say a lot. Um, they do need to get, uh, they need to get lucky. Oh, no doubt. That, everything no, like, we're saying, like, there is a huge element of luck to it. But one of them is like not having someone like Blake Fisher go pro, you know, to be like third, fourth rounder. Like that's the kind of thing. Like you just can't, just can't have that, you know, like, cause like when you look at like Ohio state, right. And look, this isn't a knock on Blake Fisher. It, he, I think he's an NFL player. So if, if you want to go pro and start your NFL career, then that's fine. 
But like you look at what Ohio State is doing, it's like all their top guys are coming back, right? And they all could go pro. Like Emeka Ibuka can go pro. JT Tolomau can go pro. You know, like the, like Travion Henderson can be is a professional running back. You know, but they're all coming back, right? And look, obviously everyone assumes that's NIL stuff, but like so what? Like they're it, it's you can take care of your players like that, right? And I think Notre Dame has the has the means to do that. I don't. It's it's not that. I think Notre Dame didn't offer Blake Fisher enough money or whatever. I just think he he wanted to be done. He wanted to go to the NFL, and that's fine. But it's just like they do need to get lucky with some of those decisions, right? Like those are big time decisions. Um, as far as proof of concept, like this team does feel like it is set up, you know, to to it, it makes sense, right? Like what they want to be, like like quarterback and offensive coordinator match up. Right, like defensive coordinator and defense matchup. Right, you get Riley Mills back, you get Howard Cross back. Like those are your inside guys. Right, you've got Jordan Batelho coming back. You've got R.J. Oban from Duke. Like he's going to be strong side end. Like you have the Xavier Watts coming back. Like he's one of the Gursky, Right, you have Ben Morrison, Christian Gray. Like you have so much there. You've got the receiver situation short up. Like it does, it does seem to make sense. Right. And I'm pr- I'm pretty bullish on the Notre Dame team in 2024 because of that stuff. Because not just that, you do, it's it's like a nice mix of the the veterans, but you also have young guys, right? You also have the Jordan Faisons and in the, the Jaden Greathouses. You also have the the freshmen coming in, uh, Cam Williams and Mikey Gilbert and Logan Saldate and Kedron Young and so on and so forth, right? Tight end, like Eli Raritan, like he looks good, like he looks like a guy, right? He looks like next in line to to be around when um until Mitchell Evans comes back. So it does seem as though um you know they they have things lined up there, right? And so then I guess this gets to the question of is Freeman ready to to make that like the jump that we were kind of hoping, you know? that was coming post 2021. Like, I feel like now is the time for that. And it's like, is he, is, is he the guy? All right. Is he, is he the guy to be the one to, to kind of get them to that point? And the thing that I'll say is that in those, the, the big games that we think about, like on the road against Ohio state, right. However it looked, he had them ready to play. It's not like they went out there and laid an egg, you know, and again, against Ohio State at home, right? They didn't go lay an egg, right? He he can get them ready to go. It's just a question of like, is he able to, you know, go do the thing, right? Um, so what's your feeling on that? What, uh, how, I mean, in your heart of hearts, how confident are you that he's I'm pre- ready for that? I'm pretty confident. A big part of that has to do with the staff. Having Al Golden and Mike Denbrock makes me feel a lot more at ease about the situation and getting the team ready to play. Because I'm actually not concerned at all about the big games. <laughs> the The big games on this 2024 schedule mm-hmm. aren't, aren't that big in comparison to that Notre Dame Ohio State game last year. But Florida State's going to be a big one. Louisville at home, especially after what happened last year, that's going to be a big game. Um, I think it, he's going to have them ready to go there. It's the games that like aren't necessarily that big, but the opponent definitely scares you. Like that Louisville game last year was so disappointing. The Clemson performance, it wasn't even that they lost to Clemson because I was actually pretty nervous that they could lose to Clemson. It felt just like, a, I need to come up with a better phrase for this, but I'm going to say it's just a college football loss. It's just mm. where if we were not so dialed into the day in, day out of Notre Dame football, like if you were to just take a step back and you looked at what Clemson was going through at the time and you looked at Notre Dame and, the circumstances there, that was a pretty trendy uh, upset. Like people were like, Clemson's actually going to get things back on track because they're a prideful program. They have a good coach. They're going to get this win. wasn't pretty. They got it done. So it's not the big games that I'm worried about really at all. I, like you said, every time Notre Dame's played in a, in a really big spot, like the Ohio State's, like they've shown up. It's just going to be a matter of when Notre Dame is struggling next year against a team that they're probably more talented than, is he going to be able to figure it out in-game and get the team back on track and close against 
uh, an inferior opponent. Like that is to me the biggest question about Freeman this upcoming season. Like I obviously have questions about like, you know, different positions. I already mentioned the offensive line. Um, the quarterback obviously is going to be a huge question mark with Riley Leonard, not to say that he won't be great, but there's just, you know, a lot of unknowns with him, but as it pertains to Marcus Freeman, what happens in those games when it's clear the team didn't come out firing out of the gates, is he going to be able to adjust on the fly and just get the win? Uh, Brian Kelly was amazing at that. And I know people don't want to hear, but that actually is a super valuable skill. Even Nick Saban, um, they had to find ways to win games against teams they really had no business even being in a game with but they never really lost those games for most of his tenure there so if freeman can demonstrate that ability and again it's not all on him part of that has to do with the staff if he can do that i think that the team is going to finish with a really strong record and then when they get to the playoffs when they get in those big games that's really his moment to shine because he's already shown that he can get them ready to play in those big games and i think that's where you can get to a point where like hey Notre Dame might actually be able to do some damage here, and this really is his moment, but he's got to get over. I mean, it could be like two or three games during the regular season where he's going to have to get his team to, to scratch and claw for a win. Okay. So I, I think the, the, the Denbrock thing is, is legit. Like, because he, he, like, I think he stabilizes like the staff, period. Like, I really do. Yeah. Like, it just because he knows how to adjust to things. I think the Riley Leonard piece is because here here's the here's the thing about riley leonard is everyone is kind of picking apart his um his his throwing ability or his 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 they're basically evaluating him as as if he's like a pro prospect because basically they need like a pro prospect they need him to be able to like they need dane brugler to like like him or something like and it's like honestly, Dane does like him. <laughs> no, but he does. But it's like yeah. I don't care. Like it's the to yeah, me. No, it's like you. like you just talked about. Like when Notre Dame's struggling, it's like last year when they struggled or with with Drew Pine or what Tyler Buckner or whatever. Like of all, is this not there? Well, then I guess they don't have it today. When Notre Dame's just going to get beat, you know. And it's like no, you can just run Riley Leonard. You can use him in a completely different way. Like there are so many things that he can do and he can open up that mitigate uh just like oh he's having a bad game he's he's not feeling it today right and like he's such a physical player and i think that kind of brings it all together too and the fact that he has an offensive coordinator like knows exactly how to use someone of his skill set um i think that's a big deal another thing is is this kind of like sneaky but i feel like notre dame has always like well i don't want to say always has traditionally shown they can go undefeated in the regular season. What happens is they have the long layoff and then they have to play like championship level programs and, and they're not ready for that. Right. After like a month or a month and a half. Right. But with the 12 team playoff thing, a, you don't have that long of a layoff and B you do get into a scenario when it's like, once you play that first game against not a championship level opponent, Right. So if you're the five, you're going to play the 12, right? Because they can't be the one or the four, the one through four. They can't be that. So you're going to be five. You're going to play the 12, right? You're not playing a championship level opponent. You probably play them at your own stadium. And then you get into like a week by week thing. And I think that benefits Notre Dame. Notre Dame is not good. And they haven't been good at these long layoffs against, you know, the Alabamas or the Clemsons or whoever they're playing in the playoffs, right? And so I think that that kind of like is a sneaky, it's kind of a sneaky benefit for them because I do think the schedule sets up well for Notre Dame this year. Um, we were talking just a second ago, like it looks pretty boring, but, but <laughs> I'll you know, take a you, boring schedule, man. you know, who's, you know, who's was super boring this year. Michigan's it's pretty, it's pretty booty. Right. So uh, it's just, you gotta, you gotta get lucky with that. What were we going to say? Where were you? Where are you on the comparisons to Michigan and how Notre Dame can sort of emulate uh, what they did and how Harbaugh constructed his program? Because I think that there are definitely some things that Notre Dame can learn from Michigan, the way that they built their their championship team. But I also think that there's some things that people are under underestimating, and uh, one of the the probably the most notable being Jim Harbaugh 
and the experience that he has. I mean, he's a weird dude. I know people have opinions about him. And the, yeah, they definitely cheated. I'm not going to deny that. But what they did after Stallions proves that like, hey, cheating aside, they still did field a really good team. It's kind of like the Astros in baseball yeah. where it's like you never had to cheat in the first place. Why did you? But like, where are you on, on what Michigan proved as it pertains to Notre Dame? Because I know that's been a big topic of discussion in the past few weeks. Um, I, Michigan's kind of unique in that, like they, they, they got, well, they, they got the thing that, um, you know, I was just talking about like Blake Corum comes back, right? Like they had a bunch of guys like come back and like, they were able to kind of just keep going the thing that was working for them. You know, they, they, they were just able to keep trying and, and they ended up getting to the point where. It's like, yeah, they they beat Ohio State, right? And they beat Penn State. Those were two teams that weren't very good this year, right? So they kind of got lucky in that. That was a really bad Ohio State team for for Ohio State, right? Yeah. Um, and then Penn funny. State, yeah. And so then Penn State, like they got they got waxed in their bowl game. Yeah. Uh, Ohio State couldn't score in their bowl game, and yeah, they didn't have the quarterback, but still, like Kyle McCord, like. He, he transferred where he go? He went to Syracuse. It's not like he went to Georgia, yeah. you know, or, or, you know, Alabama or something like that. Um, so they got that. And then they get to the, they get to the semifinals and, and they play an Alabama team that, that can't snap the ball. That's, that's nice. You know, like when, when you get to that point, right. So they can't snap. Like there's four or five times that they, they blow the snap. I mean, Alabama's driving down the field and they have a bad snap and then they have a bad snap. And next thing you know, it's third and 30. So it's like the, they gave themselves bites at the apple. And I think that the thing that that really helped them too is I think Notre Dame can kind of, you know, I, I guess take from this is that look at look at JJ McCarthy. He what what numbers did he put up? Like not, right? But what did he have? Like that guy's a freaking gamer. And like he'll 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 go and he'll run for a first down on third and eleven. Like he'll run for a first. Like he will make something happen there. What any? I don't know what kind of a pro prospect he is. Like I've heard a lot of people. Uh, some people like him. Some people were kind of less like a ah, second rounder, right? But like, man, in college in college football, you just need to be a freaking gamer. Like look at yeah. Jalen Milrow. Like he didn't. He's not a great quarterback. He's not going to be in the NFL. But man, he makes things happen. You know. And so that's kind of what you need. And so, like, look, I, I think the part is, like, you can lean on physicality if that's what you want to do. You can lean on that, right, and and be successful, you know. And that's what Marcus Freeman wants to do, right. And so, like, that is another one that they, I think they can take from it. Um, what would you say? Yeah, I think that it's encouraging to see a team like Michigan and a team like Washington in the national championship, even though the playoff is going to expand and it's going to be a little bit harder for a team, especially – one like Washington who hasn't really recruited at that level, but they just had a couple of elite playmakers on the outside and they had a terrific college quarterback in Michael Penix. Like that covers up a lot of holes. The fact that they were able to get there. I think if you're a Notre Dame fan, you have to be encouraged because um, it's not just Georgia again, even if it were Alabama, even in a down year, it still would have been like, and just another year where Alabama's at the top or Ohio state or anything like that. So I think you got to feel good. I'm not ready to say that. Oh, all of a sudden, there's going to be a ton of parody in college football. I don't think that's the case. But as it as we start to look ahead here to what Notre Dame can do in the expanded playoff, I think that there's plenty of reasons to believe that, you know, if things go their way, they obviously got to get lucky. Uh, there's a real chance for Notre Dame to compete uh, to be able to compete at that level again. And I think that using Michigan as an example is, is pretty fair. Um, I think that what what Michigan did, what they had on defense is they were so good. Like Mason Graham in the middle was just an absolute game record. Yeah. Notre Dame needs guys like that. They need one of these quarterbacks to hit, whether it be Riley Leonard or Kenny Minchie or CJ Carr, whoever it may be. I don't care. Like I have no allegiance to CJ Carr or Kenny Minchie. If one of them is great, um, it's fine by me. I know we've already kind of crowned CJ Carr, at least the fan base has, but if it's Minchie, uh, I don't really care. And I think as long as they get that, they'll have a real chance and I think that with NIL, with the transfer portal, things are going to spread out a little bit among the top. It's not going to be like, you're not going to see Purdue in the playoff anytime soon. But I am optimistic about the future. And anyone who knows me would say that I'm not necessarily the most optimistic person in the world. But as I'm sitting there and as I'm sick to my stomach watching Michigan celebrate, I'm like, could this be Notre Dame? 
I actually was able to to entertain the thought a little bit. I think I'm, I can at least be happy about that. It does seem to make it a little bit more uh, possible. So, and yeah. and to, to to bring up your point about the quarterbacks, like I that's another thing. I think Notre Dame's, I think Notre Dame's quarterback room is legit. Yeah, I, I all this talk about Marcus Freeman, we have to point out that quarterback recruiting under him has been yeah. exponentially better. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 Deuce Knight with the twenty twenty five classes, yeah. he's doing some stuff. He's he's, uh, he's 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 all in. So and he's a really good football player himself, who also fits very well with uh, Mike Denbrock. So, all right, uh, Tyler, I think that's a good place to call it. Thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it very much. I'm gonna have to go on your show once again. Locked on Irish, uh, Tyler. Tell people where you where, where they can find it. Yeah, so uh, doing daily or at least almost daily, uh, Locked on Irish, available on YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Greg's been on my show a few times. Jamie has as well. You guys do a great job. So, yeah, we'll have to do a little home and home at some point during the offseason because we've got and we've got like over eight months until the season yes. starts. So there's going to be a lot of air to fill between now and then, but I'm looking forward to it. All right, buddy. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Hit the like, hit subscribe, hit the notification bell. Links to the podcast are in the description below. We'll talk to you soon. Keep hitting and hustling.